Very many, if not most historians, seem to have reached the consensus that the description of the 20th century is best stated as the war and welfare century. The century is the bloodiest in all of history. Over 170 million people were killed as a direct result of the wars, with 10 million being killed in World War I, 50 million killed in World War II. And it is significant that in regard to the 50 million killed in World War II, that 70 percent were civilians. This was mainly the result of the bombing of cities by Great Britain and America. The number, this number of deaths does not include the estimated 6 to 12 million killed by Stalin before World War II and the several millions killed after the war by Stalin when Roosevelt and Churchill delivered to him one-third of Europe in the settlement conferences. George Crocker's excellent book, Roosevelt's Road to Russia, goes through each of these settlement conferences, such as Tehran and Yalta and the others, and shows how Roosevelt and Churchill enhanced communism in Russia and in China through deliberate concessions which strengthened communism drastically while Nazism was being extinguished in Germany. It is inconceivable to me that America could join with Stalin as an ally and promote World War II as the good war against totalitarianism. The war and American aid made Soviet Russia into a, so a super military power which threatened America and the world for the next 45 years, delivered uh, China into communism and made it a threat during the same period of time. The horror of the 20th century could hardly have been predicted at the beginning of the 19th century, which saw the 18th century end with the creation of the first classical liberal government in the world, the United States of America. It was a government founded upon the blueprint and a written constitution, which allowed very few powers into a central government. It protected individual liberties from even the vote of the majority. It provided for the ownership of private property, free speech, freedom of religion, and basically a free market economy with no direct taxes. Both political factions united behind the first administration of President Washington to proclaim a foreign policy based upon non-interventionism and neutrality in the affairs of other nations, which remained a dominant political idea of America for over 100 years. These ideas of classical liberalism began to spread into the old world of Europe and erupted, however, into a different type of revolution in France, although in the name also of liberty. The new ideal, however, adopted in the French Revolution was that of equality, and it attempted to abolish all monarchy throughout Europe. The ideas of classical liberalism were twisted and distorted in this process, but nevertheless were spread in a distorted form by force throughout Europe, thereby giving it a bad name in many countries, especially in Germany. The 19th century, however, remained in practice largely a century of individualism, material progress, and relative peace, which allowed great progress in science and technology and industry. However, the intellectual ferment during the middle of the 19th century and thereafter was decidedly towards collectivism. In about 1850, the great uh, classical liberal John Stuart Mill began to abandon the ideas of classical liberalism and to adopt socialism, as did many, many, even most of the intellectuals. After the brief Franco-Prussian War of 1870-71, Bismarck established the first welfare state in Germany. From this point up to the First World War, most German intellectuals began to glorify the state and collectivist ideas. They had ignored one lone voice in Germany, a lyric poet by the name of Holderlin, who died in 1843. This is, he made a classic statement, which was, quote, What has made the state a hell on earth has been that man has tried to make it his heaven. Hegel and Fichte come to mind in regard to that statement. Finally, the greatest tragedy of Western civilization erupted with World War I in 1914. It may be the most senseless, unnecessary, and avoidable disasters 
in human history. Classical liberalism was thereby murdered in that war and virtually disappeared and was replaced by collectivism, which reigned both intellectually and in practice throughout the remainder of the 20th century. The ideas of socialism began to take over the governments of the world following World War I. Socialism, however, was not initially a mass movement of the people, but was instead a movement created by intellectuals who became important parts of the government ruled by those collectivist politicians. While I could quote from numerous political and intellectual leaders throughout the war and welfare century, <clears throat> I've chosen one who summed up the dominant political thoughts of the entire 20th century in one short paragraph. He was the founder of fascism. He came to power in 1922 in Italy. Mussolini stated, quote, Fascism believes neither in the possibility nor the utility of peace. War alone brings up to its highest tension all human energy and, points the staff, and puts the staff of nobility upon the peoples who have the courage to meet it. It may be expected that this will be the century of authority, a century of the left, a century of fascism. For the 19th century was a century of individualism. And he puts a, puts a parenthesis here and says, liberalism, I always mean, uh, by liberalism, I mean individualism. Parenthesis closed. He says, it may be expected that this will be the century of collectivism and hence the century of the state. For fascism, the growth of empire, that is to say the expansion of the state, and its opposite is the sign of decay and death. End quote. This statement bears closer scrutiny because it dramatically states some of the dominant and guiding principles of the entire 20th century. First, it states that peace is not the goal and is not to even be desired by the governments of collectivism. Secondly, it states that war is the primary goal and is to be desired for several reasons. One is that not only is it a noble activity, but it reveals the true courage of man. It unleashes creative energy and it causes progress. Moreover, war is the prime mover to enhance and glorify the state. War is the principal method by which collectivists have achieved their goal of control by the few over the many. In other words, they seek to create war for the purpose of implementing their ideas. Number three, he states that individualism, which was the philosophy of the 19th century, is to be abolished, and specifically collectivism is to rule the 20th century. And finally, Mussolini's statement is that Fascism is recognized as a variation of other forms of collectivism, all being part of the left as opposed to the right, which is individualism. It was not until the red decade of the 30s and the appearance of Hitler that leftist intellectuals and the media began to switch fascism from the left to the right and put it on the political spectrum as an, uh, as an opposite. Uh, in opposition to what the, quote, good forms of collectivism were, which they said were socialism and communism. They were merely a rival gangs in the same neighborhood. But after Hitler rose in Germany, socialists opposed fascism as extremism on the right. The founder of fascism clearly realized that all of these collectivist ideas, socialism, fascism, and communism, belonged on the political left and were opposed to individualism on the right. So fascism is not an extreme form of individualism and is without a doubt a part of the left or collectivism. The ideals upon which America was founded were the exact opposite of those expressed by Mussolini and other collectivists on the left. So why was America in the 20th century not a bulwark for freedom to oppose all of these leftist ideas? Why didn't the American ideas of our founding fathers dominate the 20th century? Why didn't the ideas combat the left and make this the century of American freedom instead of making it the war and welfare century? It was certainly not because America was conquered by
by some foreign enemy by the force of arms. We must begin to look for the reasons of how and why America abandoned its principles of its founders and allowed this tragedy to occur. We must determine why America became influenced by leftist thoughts and the ideas of empire, the ideas of glorification of the state. How did America itself become an empire and an interventionist in World War I and World War II and create, help create the war and welfare century? We can begin by examining a quote from one of the main leaders of America in the 19th century, and I think the answer will become apparent. The statement was, this statement was made by a prominent American politician in 1838. Quote, At what point shall we expect the approach of danger? By what means shall we fortify against it? Shall we expect some transatlantic military giant to step the ocean and crush us at a blow? Never. All the armies of Europe, Asia, and Africa combined, with all the treasure of the earth, could not by force take a drink from the Ohio or make a track on the Blue Ridge in the trial of a thousand years. Abraham Lincoln is the author of those words, and he concluded his statement with the following sentence, two sentences. If destruction be our lot, we must ourselves be its author and finisher. As a nation of free men, we must live through all time or die by suicide, end quote. Lincoln himself became the principal instigator of America's suicide. It was not a foreign foe, foe that conquered us, but it was a war that the American government won, which ended the dreams of the American founders. However, leftist intellectuals have never revealed to the American people the real cause or the real effect of the American Civil War, and instead have proclaimed it as a noble war to free, slave, to free slaves and therefore worth whatever cost had to be paid. In fact, it was a war to repudiate the ideas of a limited central government, and it moved America towards a domestic empire, which led inevitably to a foreign empire several decades later. We see many photographs of Lincoln toward the end of the war, which seem to show the strain from the war. <clears throat> However, I think the strain was due mainly to the fact that by the end of the war he understood that it had been an unnecessary war, and that he had acted to secure the economic domination of the North over the South. At the end of the war, President Lincoln stated, quote, As a result of the war, corporations have been enthroned, and an era of corruption in high places will follow, and the money power of the country will endeavor to prolong its reign by working upon the prejudices of the people until wealth is aggregated into the hands of the few and the republic is destroyed. I feel at this moment more anxiety for the safety of my country than ever before, even in the midst of the war." End quote. Other key individuals recognized the real effect of the American Civil War. One of these was the great historian of liberty, Lord Acton, who wrote to another prominent American, Robert E. Lee, immediately after the war, and Lord Acton stated, quote, I saw in state rights the only availing check upon the absolutism of the sovereign will, and secession filled me with hope, not as to the destruction, but as to the redemption of democracy. Therefore, I deem that you are fighting the battles of our liberty, our progress, and our civilization. And I mourn for the state which was lost at Richmond more deeply then I rejoice over that which was saved at Waterloo. General Lee replied in a letter dated December 15, 1866, with a careful analysis of the results of the Civil War. His letter contained these words, quote, I can only say that I have considered the preservation of the constitutional power of the general government to be the foundation of our peace and safety at home and abroad. I yet believe that the maintenance of the rights and authority reserved to the states and to the people, not only essential to the adjustment and the balance of the general system, but the safeguard to the continuance of a free government. I consider it as the chief source of stability of our political system, whereas the consolidation of the states into one vast republic is sure to be aggressive abroad and despotic at home and it will be the certain precursor 
of the ruin that has overwhelmed all those governments which have preceded it. End quote. Lee clearly saw the growth of empire at home and the loss of freedom to Americans and the destruction of the original ideas of our founders. He also saw that the domestic empire would lead to an empire abroad. Consolidation of power into the central government is the basic premise of collectivism, and it is the basic idea the Constitution attempted to avoid. After the creation of the domestic American empire in the Civil War, and then after the next three decades, and at the beginning of the 20th century, America repudiated its 100-year-old foreign policy and started the Spanish-American War, allegedly to free Cuba from Spanish tyranny. But as we now know, the original and ultimate purpose was to take the Philippine Islands away from Spain in order to provide coaling stations for trade with China, which was considered by many American economic interests to be essential to America's progress. McKinley ordered the ships sent to the Philippines at the same time he sent the battleship Maine to Cuba and instructed the American Navy to support the Philippine rebels against their Spanish rulers. McKinley asked Congress to declare war because he said the Spanish sank the battleship Maine. But we know today that the explosion occurred from within the ship, just as the Spanish had said, and therefore could not have been done by Spain. In the Philippines, the native rebels were successful in throwing off their Spanish rulers and were aided in their effort by the American Navy. As soon as they were successful, McKinley ordered the American guns turned upon the rebels and murdered them by the thousands and thousands and snatched the island away from them and made it an American possession, which McKinley ruled as a military dictator without any authority from Congress. Next, without any authority from Congress, he sent 5,000 Marines into China to help put down the Boxer Rebellion, which was an effort by the Chinese to expel foreigners from their soil. America joined with other European nations in seeking the spoils of China and thereby sacrificed America's integrity and any right to be called a leader in free, for freedom in the world. Next came the greatest tragedy of the 20th century, which was America's late entry into World War I. America's entry drastically changed the balance of power of the original contenders in that war and resulted in the horrible Treaty of Versailles, which paved the road to World War II. America's entry into World War I was a natural result of the so-called progressive movement, which worshipped democracy per se. It was this so-called progressive movement, which in one year, 1913, brought on monumental changes in the, na in the name of attacking the rich for the benefit of the poor. First, the Federal Reserve System was created allegedly to control the rich banks, but instead concentrated power into the hands of an elite, few, unelected manipulators. Second, the 16th Amendment allowed the income tax, and it was alleged that the amendment would only attack the rich. However, in the First World War, the tax was raised and expanded and has become the most oppressive feature of Americans in the 20th century and today causes the middle class Americans to work approximately five to six months a year before they earn one penny for themselves. The third change <clears throat> was the 17th Amendment, which allegedly was to give power to the people by letting them elect U.S. senators rather than state legislatures. The Founding Fathers had devised this system of state legislatures electing U.S. senators in order to protect the states and give the states the power to restrain the federal government. Progressive movement also promoted the personification of Isabel Patterson's humanitarian with a guillotine by electing President Woodrow Wilson, a naive and idealistic egomaniac who took America into World War I so that he could take a part in creating the League of Nations and help design the new order, new structure of the world. Wilson also allowed the house of J.P. Morgan to become the exclusive agent for British purchases of war materials in America. Later, he further allowed Morgan to make loans and extend credit to the Allies. And eventually, Wilson caused the U.S. government to assume all of the Morgan debt, relieving Morgan of the debt, and then issued liberty bonds so the American taxpayers could help repay that. The inability 
of Great Britain and France to repay the Morgan loans, which were now to the United States, also played a major factor in Wilson's decision to enter that war. It was also a major factor in causing the Treaty of Versailles to impose such harsh terms on Germany to repay Great Britain and France for war damages. As war fever spread and the war drums beat, few people paid attention to such editorials as appeared in the commercial and financial journal, which stated, quote, It is needless to say that we shall support the government, but may we not ask one to another before the fateful final word is spoken, are we not by this act transforming the glorious republic that was into a powerful republic that is to be? Must we not admit that we are bringing into existence a new republic that is unlike the old? End quote. Wilson, like President Polk and Wilson before him, made it appear that the alleged enemy started the war by firing the first shot. German embassy had warned Secretary of State Brown that the British ship, the Lusitania, was carrying illegal weapons and was therefore a proper target for submarines uh, to sink. Secretary Brown tried to get Wilson to warn American citizens not to sail on the ship, but Wilson refused to do so because he saw that this was an opportunity where a loss of American lives would present him with an apparent reason for entering the war. After Wilson failed to give this warning, Brown resigned as Secretary of State, and over 100 Americans were killed when the German submarine sank the Lusitania. After World War I ended, and much like the regret expressed by Lincoln at the end of the Civil War, President Wilson looked back to the harm that he had brought on America and saw part of the true nature of World War I. In an address in St. Louis, Missouri, in September 1919, President Wilson stated, quote, Why, my fellow citizens, is there any man here or any woman or is there any child who does not know that the seed of war in the modern world is industrial and commercial rivalry? This war, in its inception, was a commercial and an industrial war. It was not a political war, end quote. It is sad to contemplate the loss of liberty caused by Americans by the victorious wars we have fought, when you look back and see that almost all of them were unnecessary to defend American liberty and were largely economically instigated. In so many instances, the president provoked the other side into firing the first shot so as to make it look like the war was started by America's enemy. Not only did Polk, Lincoln, McKinley, and Wilson do it, but later Roosevelt would do it in regard to Pearl Harbor, and Johnson would do it in regard to the Gulf of Tonkin resolution for Vietnam. It is not truly a study of history to speculate on what might have happened if America had not entered World War I. But I think that these are some very reasonable, even probable consequences if America had not entered. First, almost certainly there would not have been a successful Bolshevik revolution in Russia and communism would not have overthrown the government, and given communism its birth in the huge nation of Russia, which allowed communism to spread worldwide. Secondly, a negotiated treaty between an undefeated Germany and an undefeated France and Great Britain, but all of them severely wounded, would have prevented the debacle of the Treaty of Versailles, which was the greatest tragedy of World War I. A treaty instead of by those before defeat would have been negotiated with co-equal partners at the table, similar to the way the Congress of Vienna settled the Napoleonic Wars in 1815 and 1816, with France actually sitting at the table represented by Talleyrand. And a sincere effort was made to promote peace by that treaty rather than cause war in the future. Treaty of Versailles excluded Germany and Russia and declared Germany solely guilty for causing the war and saddled her with tremendous payments for war debts and took away much of Germany's territory. The Treaty of Versailles paved the way for Hitler, whose support came from the German people who wanted to throw off this tremendously and obviously unfair Treaty of Versailles. Without the rise of communism in Russia and Nazism in Germany, I do not believe that World War II would have occurred. There are many important lessons that the 20th century, the war and welfare century, could teach us. I want to talk about two of those. One of those is summed up by Bruce Porter in his excellent book, 
entitled War and the Rise of the State. Quote, Throughout the history of the United States, war has been the primary impetus behind the growth and development of the central state, just as Mussolini said that it would be. Continuing, it, it, war, has been the lever by which presidents and other national officials have boasted the power of the state in the face of tenacious popular resistance. It has been the wellspring of American nationalism and a spur to political and social change. End quote. The same lesson is contained in a warning issued by the great champion of liberty and student of American democracy, democracy Alexis de Tocqueville, who warned America in the early part of the 19th century that, quote, all those who seek to destroy the liberties of a democratic nation ought to know that war is the surest and the shortest means to accomplish it. And, end quote. He was talking about victorious wars, not wars that you lose. A second lesson is that democracy per se will not protect our freedom or individual liberty. I've heard college students ask the question, why did the Greeks who invented democracy remain so critical of it? Well, the answer, of course, is that without proper restraints and the limitation of powers as provided by the American Constitution, a democracy can be just as tyrannical as a single despot. F. A. Hayek made this point when he stated, quote, There can be no doubt that in history there has often been much more cultural and political freedom under an autocratic rule than under some democracies. And it is at least conceivable that under the government of a very homogeneous, doctrinaire, majority democratic government might become as oppressive as the worst dictatorship, end quote. We should learn from the war and welfare century that the greatest discovery of Western civilization was that liberty could be achieved only through the proper and effective limitation on the power of the state. It is this limitation upon the state which protects private property, free market economy, personal liberties, and promotes a non-interventionist foreign policy. And this is what will bring peace and prosperity instead of war and welfare. But it is not democracy per se which protects freedom. Too many people Living in democracies are lulled into believing that they are free because they have the right to vote and elections are held periodically. If you take the draft as an example, I think you would find that if the draft were proclaimed by a sole monarch, people would revolt and disobey. However, in a democracy, when the politicians vote for it, the people comply and still think they are free. The fall of the Berlin Wall and demise of the Soviet Empire do not assure us that collectivism is dead. In fact, I predict that the next assault on freedom by the new leftist intellectuals will be through a democratic, probably a religious movement, or at least one which is not anti-religious. Many, maybe most Americans who opposed communist Soviet Russia were convinced that it was wrong and evil because it was atheistic and godless, and not because it, of its political and economic ideas. I think the new collectivist monster will be dressed in different clothes, advocating equality, justice, democracy, and market socialism. It will be more important than ever for intellectuals of the future to have a correct understanding of the philosophy of freedom and the philosophy of the free market in order to fight collectivism in the 20th century. It will take, it will take a new intellectual to do that. It would be more important than ever for Americans to understand why Ludwig von Mises in his book Omnipotent Government stated the following, quote, Durable peace is only possible under perfect capitalism, hitherto never and nowhere completely tried or achieved. In such a Jeffersonian world of the unhampered market economy, the scope of government activities is limited to the protection of lives, health, and property of individuals against violence or fraudulent aggression. <clears throat> All of the oratory of the advocates of government omnipotence cannot annul the fact that there is but one system that makes durable peace, a free market economy. Government controls lead to economic nationalism, and this results in conflict. The meaning of a free market which Mises states will allow us to have peace and prosperity is one where the economy is free of government control but also 
where economic interests do not control government policy, especially foreign policy, as has been the case in the 20th century. The highest risk for war is where various economic interests are able to control foreign policy to promote those particular economic interests rather than the well-being or liberty of the nation as a whole. The Mises Institute is working to promote the ideas of Mises, Hayek, Rothbard, and many other true believers in individual freedom. These are the ideas that can make the 21st century one of peace and prosperity rather than war and welfare. That is why the Mises Institute is so important to the future of America and of the world. Thank you.